just a mile from the state capitol here in Madison, Wisconsin, a place that has become the talk of the nation due to massive protests over Governor Walker, Walker's budget repair bill. While the budget repair bill is still being debated, or not debated, on Tuesday, Walker introduced his biennium budget, which has generated additional controversy in the state. Joining me today to discuss all of the debate and political drama about Governor Walker's budget repair bill, along with the new biennium budget, are my colleagues, Professor David Cannon, Political Science Department at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and John Coleman, the chair of the Political Science Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. John? You're the chair, you're the boss, so I'll start with, uh, I'll start with you. Um, for maybe the seven people out there who haven't been paying attention to what's been going on in, in, in our state, could you sum up what the basic elements of the budget repair bill are? One component of it really isn't controversial, but then there are some significantly controversial elements of it. Right. Well, the bill is trying to take care of a current deficit that we face up through June 30th. And so the parts of the bill that at this point aren't being talked about very much We'll provide some funding for programs that were set to run out of money sometime in uh, April or May. And part of the way of doing that was restructuring some debt. Part of the way of doing that was requiring public employees to pay more in their pension and in their uh, health for, for their health care premium. Uh, all of that has been obscured by the, uh, the sort of more dramatic part of the, the budget repair bill, which was to significantly change collective bargaining for public employees in Wisconsin. Uh, what it would do is at the, um, at the state and local level limit public collective bargaining to wages, not to benefits or other kinds of uh, concerns. And it would have annual elections for recertification of unions, 50% support of all of the members of the unit, not just the people who happen to, uh, happen to vote. And um, as we've seen over the last two weeks, uh, that has been met with a just a storm of protest and a storm of uh, support on, on each side. We just had this huge national debate uh, at this point as well. The immediate financial parts of the budget repair bill have become a little less controversial at this point. The unions agreed to the concessions on pensions and health benefits, which they had opposed in December, but seeing the writing on the wall to some degree, they, they gave in on those. But it's this long-term change in collective bargaining that has really caused the firestorm. So, David, there's, there's sort of clearly some strong public opinion support for public employees contributing to, to their own pensions. But as, but as John said, it's this other part about uh, collective bargaining and greatly restricting the power of public employee unions that's caused this huge firestorm. We're hearing the term public employee union. We're hearing the term collective bargaining a lot. What exactly does that mean, and why are the unions really making this a, uh, uh, you know, the hill they're going to fight and die on? Right. <clears throat> public employee, <clears throat> excuse me, public employee unions, they, this, they see this as their, their really only way they can have the kind of power that they have in the economic system, which is to be able to, to bargain for their wages and for all their working conditions and, and other benefits. And this is something that the Republicans want to, to weaken or, or perhaps stop because they are so closely aligned with the Democratic Party. So there's definitely a political element to this, you know, where if the Republicans can weaken public employee unions, that'll weaken one of the biggest political opponents they have in, in the elections and campaigns. Now, there's obviously a, an economic component to this as well, that Governor Walker has said that if we can get rid of collective bargaining, it'll make it a lot easier for the 2,000 uh, bargaining units in the state of Wisconsin to be able to hold a line on their budgets and to reduce costs in a way that'll be more efficient. So there's clearly both an economic element and a political element to the desire to uh, to limit the power of, of public unions. Well, let me ask you for a second to put on both political hats and debate yourself here for okay. a second. What's the argument against public employee unions, and how would public employee unions differ than private unions? Is there a philosophical distinction there? Right. Yeah, and it, what Republicans say, and they often point to the fact that, that FDR opposed public employee unions because he saw them as having too much of a, a vested interest in the, in the public sector. And you can have this kind of, you know, uh, relationship between the party in power and the, the, the people who are working for the state in a way that's kind of mutually reinforcing. So you don't have that same kind of market mechanism that's there holding the unions in check that would be true in the private sector. So that's the Republicans' argument of why public employee unions are different, really, than private sector uh, unions. John, we've seen recently um, you know, op-ed in the New York Times by Michael Bloomberg, who was 
not sure how to describe him, once a Democrat, then a Republican, now an independent, mm -hmm. Chris Christie, uh, Republican uh, governor of New Jersey, who's been no friend of public employee unions or right. teachers, coming out in favor of collective bargaining in public employee unions. What's sort of the argument for public employee unions? Right. Well, I, I think there's a couple things going on. One is, um, for someone like Christie, he's also dealing with the realistic situation in New Jersey, which arguably would even be tougher than uh, in Wisconsin because of the, the strong strength of the unions there. I think part of it is simply to say this is the way that you get uh, cooperative relationships between management and labor. It doesn't mean you get the bargain on everything. It doesn't mean that every gets, everything gets put in a contract, uh, but that this creates a more trusting relationship perhaps between the state or localities and their various uh, uh, their various employees and uh, certainly there's something to that uh, to that argument thinking back to the you know what the argument would be on the other side that republicans would make it's somewhat akin uh, the way i think of this is it's somewhat akin to talking about a diet and what the folks advocating the kind of changes in wisconsin would say is it's okay to go on a diet for two years but you'll lapse back into the bad habits unless you make these kind of structural reforms. Exactly the kind of thing that David talked about where there are very few public employee unions that have a vested interest in making government smaller and in reducing spending consistently over time. The, the tendency is to want more positions, more jobs, more benefits, more pay. And so part of the Republican philosophical argument, aside from the political, is to say that you know we have to change the behavior. We can't just go on a two-year diet, but we have to go on a more long-term kind of regimen change. Right. Another thing too, just to add on the the, the side of uh, looking at the positive side, and this is something I think is is true in Wisconsin, but around the country as well, is that the management side of this actually wants collective bargaining. So if you look at the Wisconsin uh, League of Municipalities, the Wisconsin League of School Boards, the management side of this debate, they say they want collective bargaining. It's worked well for the last 50 years. They have good relationships, you know, with their public employees, and that's the way they can work cooperatively to get things done. They don't even want to get rid of collective bargaining themselves, and so I think that speaks to John's point about how this has worked pretty well in Wisconsin over the years and in terms of how you can keep relations between labor and management on an even keel. So there's, a, there's, there's an interesting philosophical debate about the role of public employee unions or a practical debate in terms of negotiating. But in terms of pure, of pure politics here, um, there's been some consequences to Governor Walker making this proposal. And let's just, for, for, for those of us who are watching us who are not in Wisconsin, this is a state where Governor Walker won. It was, it was, Governor Doyle was not on the ballot, but an eight-year incumbent or two or an eight-year reign of a, of a Democrat for, for governor. Russ Feingold, U.S. Senator, lost here, Democrat. Uh, Republicans took control of both the state Senate and the state assembly by very large margins. And a lot of people were saying that Republicans in Wisconsin were in position to really dominate state politics for the next 10 years. How's the politics of this playing out now for Governor Walker? Well, yeah, I think that they were in a great position. After the, the elections in November, they really could pretty much write their ticket, I think, for the next decade, had they played their cards right. Uh, and they were in a position to you know, be able to get most of what they wanted in the budget, but I think they probably overplayed their hand a little bit. It's, it's kind of analogous what the Democrats did in, in 2009, 2010, with the overreach, uh, and the Democrats got hammered in the midterms because the public saw the Democrats as going too far too fast on a lot of areas, especially health care, obviously. But I think the Republicans are in danger of doing the same thing here in Wisconsin of going too far too fast without any kind of, of bipartisan consensus behind what they're doing. Now, obviously, given the size of their victory in November, they should be able to get you know, 90% of, of what they want, but that 10% could have really diffused this, uh, this, uh, the opposition they're seeing right now and had a more consensual uh, process. And I think they missed that opportunity because it's so polarized now. The, the atmosphere is so poisoned, it's going to be hard to unravel the, uh, where we are right now, I think. John, on the other hand, like Barack Obama argued after the 2008 election, elections have consequences. Right. And so I think Republicans would argue in the same way that Obama knew that he needed to act quickly, they knew, to, they, knew they needed to act quickly to get through some things. I think that's right. And both of these cases that you just raised, these are parties that felt that they had been in the wilderness, even if they had controlled Congress or state legislative uh, chambers, that unless you have the control at the top is particularly in Wisconsin where the governor is so powerful and the veto power is, is so strong and his role in the budget is so dominant that when you have that, 
and you've got these huge majority, not huge majorities, but you've got these, uh, the, the seismic sort of changes across the country and solid majorities in the Wisconsin Assembly, changes at the national level. It does encourage the kind of thinking David was talking about that we saw with the Democrats in 2008, that elections have consequences. Let's hit for the grand slam, even if we don't have all the bases loaded yet necessarily, <laughs> and see what the consequences are. And if we can do it early in our term, We'll see if we can ride it out and things get better as time goes on, if the economy picks up and, and so on. So it's hard to judge exactly what the ultimate consequence would be for Governor Walker. If he came out of this and his approval rating was 45% or something like that, you might say, well, after all that happened, you're still at 45%. Maybe that was a hit worth taking. If it goes down below that, then you start, you know, the, the long-term implications, uh, I think, are much more damaging. But we'll certainly have you both on many times before that. But it's probably also the case that if we're sitting here three, four years from now and the Wisconsin economy is significantly turning around, it's going to definitely color how we looked at what's, uh, what's happening here. But thanks to you, John. Thanks to you, Dave, for joining us on Office Hours Special Web Extra. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this special Office Hours Web Extra on the current budget repair bill struggle in the state of Wisconsin. Just a mile here from the University of Wisconsin campus as uh, not only office hours but uh, the nation and international media is paying attention to Madison, Wisconsin where many of you went to school. So please check us out on our regular show on the Big Ten Network and keep paying attention to wisc.edu for other office hour extras online. Thank you. I'm Ken Goldstein from University of Wisconsin.